for most of you who drive, I think at some point during your driving experience, you've been behind somebody who wasn't sure where they were going. I'll try to recall a time, maybe it happened even this past week. And if you've been behind somebody who doesn't know exactly where they're going, there are some symptoms that you usually see which help you know that they don't know exactly where they're going. Typically, they start to drive slow, like abnormally slow. Like some people are slow drivers, like I'm a decently slow driver, but they are abnormally slow when they are not knowing where they're about to go. They sometimes have their blinker on for an extended period of time to the point where you put no stock in that blinker anymore. You're like, I don't care whether it's left or right. It doesn't matter because it's been on for about 10 blocks already. It doesn't really matter anymore because I don't know if they know where they're going to go. Sometimes they may swerve because they think, OK, is this it? Oh, um, that's not it. OK, and they swerve left to right. And usually, if you're with somebody who has a little bit of impatience towards that kind of thing, you eventually hear somebody say something like this, this guy doesn't know where he's going. <laughs> I think most people have said that at some point in their lives. Now, interestingly, some people's lives are like that. Some people don't know where they're going ultimately, so temporally, their life is without direction. It's as though they don't know where they're going ultimately, so in the details of life, they don't really know what they're doing temporally. Jesus' life on earth was nothing like that. His consciousness of his purpose and the reason that he was here was so fixed in his mind. In John's Gospel, in John 4, verse 34, Jesus said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. In John 6, 38, Jesus said, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And he knew that his father's painful will for his life reached its apex in Jerusalem. That's why Luke wrote in Luke 9, verse 51, when the time had come for him to be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. Now what's amazing about the proverbial drive of Jesus' life is not only that he had this assurity of purpose, but to use that same driving illustration, it's as though multiple cars were following him with the intention of murdering him while he was on this proverbial drive. Just imagine that. How would you drive if you knew there were some people either tailgating you or not too far behind you who were following you with the intention of killing you? I think for most of us, at some level, we would be panicked. Jesus was undaunted. For much of his earthly ministry, Jesus was pursued by people who wanted to kill him. So while he was going about the business of reaching the painful apex that was at Jerusalem when he would go to the cross, along the way on his proverbial drive, he had multiple cars coming alongside of him or behind him, all hoping to kill him before he got there. Not knowing the significance of what he would do there, but still wanting to kill him before he got there. And then, and then in that, we see our Savior's courage. As we behold an example of that in our text this morning, part of what I'm hoping will happen is that as we see our Savior's mental fortitude to stay the course despite the threats that were around Him, I pray that it will bulk up and build up not only our awe of Him, but our own steadfastness of faith as we see that our days are ultimately in the Lord's hands. So we have no need to fear men. Our text begins where we left off last week, but to create a little bit of context, I want to remind you where we were last week. Last week, we saw that Jesus was journeying towards Jerusalem, Luke chapter 11, verse 22. And as he was journeying there, he was doing what he so often did, teaching. Remember, let's never forget such a main component of Jesus' earthly ministry was teaching. I read to you a whole series of texts last week, because sometimes we forget that a main component of Jesus' earthly ministry was teaching, 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 teaching. And that's what he was doing on the way to Jerusalem. And as he was teaching, somebody from the crowd, one man, we don't know anything else about him, he asks a question. He says, Lord, are there few who are being saved? 
And Jesus, if you remember, didn't answer that man in that context. We'll get to what he said to that man in a moment. But Jesus did answer that question during the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew chapter 7, he said that narrow is the way that leads to life. And few there be that find it. So the answer to that man's question, are there few who are being saved? Against the backdrop of our pluralistic society, of the universalist tendencies within our modern culture, Jesus said, narrow is the way that leads to life. And are there few who are being saved? Yes, few will find it. But Jesus, if you remember, he didn't answer that man directly. He took that man's question as an opportunity to speak to the crowd. He spoke to them. And then he told the crowd, strive to enter through the narrow gate. For many, I say to you, will seek to enter and not be able. And I'm not going to rehearse last week's message, but it just bears upon us just to have this reminder. Jesus, and we're going to take his words, we're going to apply it to new covenant Christians. There should be an expectation in a new covenant Christian's life of running the race with diligence, of striving to enter into the narrow gate, having already been justified by faith. And sometimes, again, in modern-day evangelicalism, this whole idea of carrying the cross, this whole idea of being diligent to make your calling and election sure, this whole idea of examining yourself to find out whether or not you actually are a Christian. Maybe you just have some intellectual assent to Jesus, but you're not truly converted. That's where we were last week, because Jesus told the crowd, strive to enter into the narrow gate. No, you can't be saved by law-keeping. I mean, he would say during his public ministry, he who believes has everlasting life. You're saved by faith alone. But the faith that saves is not alone. It comes with running and zealous striving to live a life worthy of the gospel. Jesus painted a solemn picture after he gave that striking exhortation. The solemn picture that he painted was one of a household where the master of the house had risen up And he shut the door. He had people inside with him. And he had people on the outside. And people on the outside began to say, Master, open, open for us. And then twice we see Jesus say these words. We see Jesus tell them, I do not know you where you are from. So not only I don't know you, but we don't even have such a level of intimacy at all. It's as though I don't even know where you're from. Like I don't really, I don't know you. But they're like, you ate, we ate and drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. We have some external connection to you. Like we were around, I'm going to apply it to us, we were around the preaching of your word. We were around the ordinances. You ate and drank in our presence. You taught in our churches. And again, Jesus would say, I do not know you where you are from. And then he would quote the psalmist, quote David and say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Then the solemn picture is contrasted between this amazing little snapshot we get of people from the north, south, east, and west, i.e. Gentiles, just like us, sitting down in the kingdom of God with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This picture of rest, your striving is over, you're sitting down, you have fellowship, you're at the table. Pass me the green beans, Peter. You're home, you're there, you're in heaven. And then the picture, that's a solemn picture of those who are on the outside where Jesus said there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So there's remorse and there's anger on the outside. That's the solemn picture he painted. So now on that very same day that Jesus was teaching this, not necessarily at the same moment, but on the same day, we read in verse 31, Luke chapter 13, on that very day some Pharisees came saying to him, Get out and depart from here, for Herod wants to kill you. So if you remember, earlier in Luke chapter 13, there were some people who brought Jesus a news flash, and they asked Jesus about the blood of the worshipers and the sacrifices that they were, being, that they were offering and how Pilate murdered them, and their blood was mingled with the blood of their sacrifices. Jesus was teaching, Luke chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. All of a sudden people come up and they say, a news flash, we got a news flash, something has happened. What do you think about this, Jesus? I don't know how recent it was or not, but they gave a news flash. Here's another news flash. It's on a different day. But the Pharisees come with a news flash of a personal nature. Jesus, we got a message for you. And the message goes like this. Get out of here and depart from here, for Herod wants to kill you. Jesus received a death threat on the same day that he was teaching what we studied last week. Now, this wasn't anything that was really new for Jesus. 
Jesus spent much of his life with people wanting to kill him. Or at least the early part of his life, and then a lot of his earthly ministry. The Herod that's mentioned here, his father was the Herod from Matthew chapter 2, who when he heard from the wise men that a Savior had been born in Bethlehem, he gave the command and the decree that in all the districts of Bethlehem, every male child who was two and under was to be murdered. Matthew chapter 2, verse 16. But we see that God protected Jesus because an angel of the Lord came to Joseph in a dream and said, Arise, get out of here. Bring the baby, the child, to Egypt. It will later fulfill the prophecy out of Egypt that I've called my son. But then later on, when Jesus began his public ministry, his first teaching, his first sermon, was in his hometown synagogue, Nazareth. Presumably the place where he spent much time growing up and much time going into synagogue. And after Jesus preached his first sermon there, he opens up to the book of Isaiah. He says, this day the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing as he reads from Isaiah 61. It looks like everything's going great. The people are astonished. They haven't heard words like this. But then shortly after, Jesus makes an application to that unbelieving Jewish generation. He basically says something like this. Just like in the days of Elijah the prophet, and just like in the days of Elisha the prophet, where there was widespread unbelief in Israel, and God bypassed the widows who were in Israel, and he went to a Sidonian Gentile widow, and just as God bypassed the lepers that were in Israel, and Elijah went to Naaman the Syrian, another Gentile, that's what's happening or going to happen here. And then the people didn't like the sound of that, so they took Jesus out of the city to the brow of the hill, and they were going to throw him off of a cliff. You might miss that little detail in Luke chapter 4, verses 28 and 29. Miraculously, seemingly, Jesus just passed through the midst of them. They wanted to kill him. They didn't want to have a talk with him by the cliff. They wanted to throw him over the cliff. Mark's Gospel, early on in Mark's Gospel, we're told that when, Mark, when Jesus healed a woman, or healed a man, who had a withered hand on the Sabbath day, in Mark chapter 3, verse 6, we're told, Then the Pharisees went out and immediately plotted with the Herodians, which was pretty incredible because they basically disagreed about everything. They were like at odds about so many things, but they agreed on this. Let's kill Jesus. And they get together... Pharisees went out, immediately plotted with the Herodians against him, how they might destroy him. So the sinless Son of God was continuously the target of people's murderous threats, and here it's no different. The Pharisees come, and they tell him, Herod wants to kill you. Jesus was apparently in Herod, this Herod, Herod Antipas, he was apparently in his jurisdiction, which was in Galilee and Perea. And this Herod was not a nice guy. In fact, interestingly, of all the rulers, when Jesus was brought to the rulers shortly before he was crucified and he was brought, whether it was to Annas or to Pilate, it's only to this man, when Jesus stands before him, that Jesus says absolutely nothing. It's as though Jesus had nothing to say to this man. Leon Morris he put it well when he said, when Jesus has nothing to say to a man, that man's position is hopeless. This man was a tetrarch. He ruled a certain portion of land in Palestine, namely Galilee and Perea. He was an Idumean. He was supposedly a practicing Jew, but he embraced heathenism, and he was a murderer. This Herod is the same Herod who, during his birthday feast, acquiesced to the sinful request of his unlawful wife's daughter, Salome, to bring the head of John the Baptist on a platter, and he did it. This was a murderous man. Interestingly, in our text, we're told that the Pharisees are the ones who come and tell Jesus about this death threat. What do you make of that? <laughs> what are we to think about this? Are the Pharisees turning over new leaves? Are they thinking, you know what? Oh, we've been trying to kill this guy too long ourselves. We want to make sure he doesn't get killed by anyone anymore. So they come and they tell Jesus, get out of here, Herod wants to kill you. So is that what was happening? They didn't want to see Jesus to get hurt? Or were they testing Jesus, maybe? Let's see how he reacts when there's a threat against his life. Let's see how he responds. 
Were they just making up the story? Some people believe that, that they were just making up the story to see Jesus hit the road. I don't think that was the case. But before I get to what they were doing, I just want to say this by way of a point of application. I think there's a lesson to be drawn out from this text. When people who hate you seem to be looking out for your best interests, be on guard. Seriously, some of you work with people who don't like you. And when they say, you know what? Why don't you go home early and I'll take care of this for you? You know, really, go home. You're tired. You're, kind of, you're coming off of a cold. Allergy season's been really bad. You know, pollen, see the pollen count? Why don't you go home and get some rest? You say, thank you. No, thank you. Because <laughs> you don't all of a sudden begin to trust them. And that's scriptural wisdom. That's not, not just a George application from this text. That's scriptural wisdom. Because in Proverbs chapter 27, verse 6, we're taught, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. So whenever people who are your enemies, that doesn't mean you're their enemies. You may have nothing against them at all. But for some reason, they just keep trying to mess you up. They keep trying to hurt you. They keep trying to make you look silly. And if all of a sudden they seem to have your best intentions in mind, be aware and be careful. It's a good application for us to draw out. So what was going on here? The Pharisees were probably sent by Herod with a message. And they probably both shared the same desire. Let's get Jesus out of here. So Herod probably used the Pharisees, go bring this message to Jesus. Get him out of my territory. I don't want him here. He threatens me. And the Pharisees were probably like, good, we love to bring messages of threats to Jesus. We'll tell him that you want to kill him. And our hope, perhaps implied, we want to bring him back into the jurisdiction of the Sanhedrin. Let's get him back in our territory, where when we have the right opportunity, when we could trap him, then we'll hatch our plan to bring him to trial and have him killed. That's what seems to be going on right here in verse 31. So now how would Jesus react? Death threat against his life. What is he going to do? He's going to try to find out all the details about the death threat. He's going to go on Google, start trying to figure out how many ways in which people want to kill him or something like that. Is he going to become all of a sudden consumed with the fact that people want to kill him? Beware! Beware, because in our day, as it becomes increasingly unpopular to be a Christian, be aware that you don't become consumed with just finding out how much people hate you. You want to stay the course with what God has called you to do. You want to be in the Word of God. You have no need to be consumed with how many people hate you and why they hate you. Is that what Jesus is going to do? I need to figure out all the details. What is he going to try to do? Why does he hate me? How is he going to try to kill me? Is he going to become consumed with all the details of this death threat? Look what he says. Look what he does. And he said to them, verse 32, Go tell that fox, Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I shall be perfected. That was the response of Jesus to Herod's death threat. We'll explore the significance of that in a moment, but let's dissect that because there are some things there that probably caught your attention. The first part of Jesus' response should catch our attention. Look at the identification he used for Herod. He said, go tell that fox. Clearly, this was an expression of divine contempt for Herod. That's important. This was divine contempt for Herod. Jesus wasn't disobeying say, Exodus chapter 22, verse 28, which says, you shall not, forward on a little bit further, curse a ruler of your people. Remember in Acts 23, Paul, when he was speaking to the high priest, said, God will strike you, you whitewashed tomb. And then all of a sudden they say, you speak that way to the high priest? And Paul was like, I didn't know. It's written, you shall not speak evil of the ruler of your people. So was Jesus disobeying that here? Not at all. Jesus was expressing divine contempt, something akin to the language that the prophets of old would use. Don't forget, Jesus was not only the God-man, but as the God-man, he was the ultimate king, the ultimate priest, and the ultimate prophet. Think of some of the language that the prophets used. The prophet Ezekiel, for example, speaking of Israel's leaders, said, Her princes in the midst of her are like wolves tearing the prey, to shed blood, to destroy people, and to get dishonest gain. Zephaniah said, Zephaniah Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 3, 
Her princes in her midst are roaring lions. Her judges are evening wolves that leave not a bone till morning. So Jesus wasn't speaking out of turn. Jesus was using a divinely appointed designation, unflattering as it was, for Herod. Go tell that fox. So what's in the name? What's in that identification fox? We can unpack that in about three ways. First thing we could say about it is a fox denoted somebody who was sly and crafty. So immediately, contextually, perhaps Jesus is saying something like this. I'm on to Herod's little scheme of wanting to get me out of his territory. I see the little plan and him sending you guys. It's not like you guys are just like, you know, good guys looking out for me. Go tell that fox, that sly and crafty one. That seems to be one element of why Jesus calls him a fox. The second element, I think, would come from the Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 15. Remember, we were told that it's the little foxes that spoil the vineyards. So foxes denoted trouble, damage, They were destruction-causing. The third element would be this. It potentially also denoted the insignificance of a ruler. Rulers were often connected to majestic animals like lions or eagles. In this case, Herod is compared to something insignificant like a fox. He's not saying, go and tell that lion or that eagle. Go tell that insignificant fox. Herod lived up to each one of those designations, all three of them. And the message that Jesus had for him was, Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures. Today and tomorrow and the third day I shall be perfected. For explaining that part of the verse, one bit of clarification. The last part in our New King James comes across like this, And the third day I shall be perfected. There is a sense in which we do see that element of Jesus and his earthly ministry in other places of Scripture like Hebrews, that the captain of our salvation was made perfect through the things he suffered. Not as though Jesus was not perfect. He was always without sin. He was always flawless. But to be perfect, to be the perfect Savior, he had to suffer. Suffering was a key component of him becoming the Savior that could save his people from their sins. Now, with that being said, I don't think necessarily that's what's happening here in this verse. I think the NASB and the ESV, I think, translate it better when they say, respectively, ESV first, NASB second, and the third day, I finish my course, and the NASB, and the third day, I reach my goal. I think Jesus is using a kind of proverbial statement to say something like this. I'm going to keep doing the work that my Father's called me to do today and tomorrow. I'm going to keep casting out demons. I'm going to keep healing the sick. And ultimately, on the third day, i.e., when my work is completed, maybe even perhaps a reference to the resurrection, I'm going to keep staying the course today, tomorrow, and the next day. A proverbial statement, something akin to Hosea chapter 6, verse 2, if you wanted to look up a kind of akin kind of statement there, I think that's what Jesus is saying right here. As though he's saying, I'm going to do my job. I'm going to be about my father's business. Herod, you could threaten me all you want. Doesn't matter. You're a fox. You're an insignificant ruler. I'm on a divinely appointed timetable. You can't stop it. I have an appointment with Jerusalem. And I'm going to make it there. I'm going to stay the course doing the work that God's called me to do today and tomorrow. And ultimately, I will reach my course for its completion at Jerusalem. The Father has ordained it. I will do it. Herod was a potential distraction, but he was not a potential deterrent. He didn't determine the date of Jesus' death. The Godhead did. And Jesus was not going to stop moving towards his appointed end. Now let's draw out some application for us from that. I think when we behold the courage of our Savior in the midst of a death threat, yes, he had prophetic insight to where he was going and what he was doing, but just behold it for what it is. People come up to him. Herod wants to kill you. And he basically says, you tell Herod, I'm going to keep doing what my father has called me to do. Behold the way in which Jesus was not beholden to the fear of men. He wasn't beholden to the fear of men. 
You're not going to stop me. The fear of man is not going to stop me from doing what God has called me to do. I'm going to stay the course. And I want to encourage you. Let not the fear of men stop you from doing what God has called you to do. Let not the fear of men stop you from sharing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ or the truth that's inseparable to it. Resist every single temptation that comes your way to be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Put to death through the Holy Spirit every sense of ungodly fear that you feel. And do not be beholden to the fear of men. Jesus wasn't even when his life was at stake. Ligon Duncan told a story about a missionary and his wife who were in closed territory. I don't know where this was, but this was an area that was closed to the gospel, meaning that if you were a Christian in this land or you tried to propagate the Christian truth of the gospel, you would be killed. And they were in this land, and one day they went to a rural area to go and get some supplies. They went to a store. And as the man went into the store, a man with a gun who was standing outside the store, followed him into the store. And then after he followed him in the store, when he walked out, the missionary, the man with the gun, also walked out as well. The man got into the car with his wife, and his wife asked him, are you going to hand the Bible to that man? And the husband said something along the lines of, no, I'm not going to hand the Bible to that man. I don't intend on dying today. But the conversation went on a little bit more. He said, really, you're not going to hand a Bible to that man? The conversation went back and forth. Really, he's got a gun. I don't know all the words that took place, but you could imagine the words that took place. He's got a gun. He just followed me into the store. Maybe we could pass on this opportunity, especially if we believe in the doctrine of election. Maybe somebody else could do it when he doesn't have a gun in his hand. Maybe that's what we could do. So this wife, she begins to pray in the car with her husband right there. She says, Lord, on the judgment day, may the blood of this man not be counted against me, who my husband will not even give a Bible. <laughs> now, don't get me wrong. I, I'm not for praying at people when you're praying. And I don't even think that's necessarily what she was doing. I think that was the expression of her heart. Like, Lord, there's something wrong here. He's doing something wrong. He's afraid of this man. And there was a godly courage in her. You have to see that. He stops the car. They turn around. He goes back. He gets out of the car. And he says, I forgot to give you something. And he gives the man a Bible. And the man says to him in response, three nights ago in a dream, I was told to come here and someone would give me the book of life. Thank you for giving me this book. That's just one added element, a little bit of an incentive for why you should not be beholden to the fear of men. Because behind the cloak of ungodly fear might be gift-wrapped an opportunity to harvest a salvation. Right there. Don't be beholden to the fear of men. You don't know what God is doing. On the other side of that, if you walk past that fear, you may have the privilege of harvesting, as it were, a salvation that has been prepared by God. There's one other element of this that I just want to point out because I think it's important as well. We ought to embrace biblical bravery because if we are Christians, we know that our days are in the Lord's hands. We know that He orders our steps. We know that He causes all things to work together for our good. We know that He has appointed a certain end for us. And if we are Christians, we will run the race by His grace and we will finish the course. We know our time is in His hands. I think J.C. Ryle put it well when he said, There is something in our Lord's words which demands the attention of all true Christians. There is a frame of mind exhibited to us which we should do well to copy. Our Lord, no doubt, spoke with a prophetic foresight of coming things. He knew the time of his own death, and he knew that this time was not yet come. Foreknowledge like this, of course, is not granted to believers in the present day. But there still is a lesson here which we ought not to overlook. We ought, in a certain measure, to aim at having the mind that was in Christ Jesus. We ought to seek to possess a spirit of calm, unshaken confidence about things to come. We should study to have a heart, and then he quotes Psalm 112, verse 7, not afraid of evil tidings, but quiet, steady, and trusting in the Lord. If you're a believer, you don't believe in luck, you don't believe in chance. You believe that the sovereign king of the universe is over all things. So you don't worry about death threats that may come your way. Not that you don't take them seriously. Not that the prudent man does not see the evil and avoid it because that is proverb wisdom. 
but you want to say, like Jesus said, something more like, I've got to keep doing what I have to do today and tomorrow, and on the third day, I'll finish my work. So immediately after that, Jesus says something similar. He goes on, verse 33, Nevertheless, I must journey today, tomorrow, and the day following. For it cannot be that a prophet should perish outside of Jerusalem. Here we are reminded of what I like to call the divine ought. Jesus had a sense of oughtness, if you will. He said, I must journey today, tomorrow, and the day following. That word that's used there in the Greek for must is the Greek word day. It carries with it a seriously, seriously strong sense of responsibility to the point of inevitability. I must journey today, tomorrow, and the day following. Why did Jesus have this sense of divine ought? Where did it come from? I think it came from two places. Primarily, the love that he had for his Father and the love that he had for his people. In John chapter 14, verse 31, shortly before being delivered into the hands of men, shortly before going to the cross, Jesus said this, but that the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, so I do, arise, let us go from here. That was where the divine sense of ought came from. I love the Father, and so that the world may know that I love the Father. Disciples, get up, we're going. We're on the way to Gethsemane. And then shortly thereafter, we're on the way, or I'm on the way, to Golgotha. Why? Because I love the Father, so that the world may know that I love the Father. I'm going to do this. It's not just enough for me to say, I love the Father. It's because I love the Father. Come with me. I'm going to do this. You see the connection there? The divine sense of ought. I must do this. Because I love the Father. So what preceded the doing? The loving preceded the doing. But what followed? What preceded? The doing. I love the Father. Therefore, I must go. And it wasn't just that Jesus loved the Father that he journeyed to Jerusalem. It was because Jesus loved his bride that he went to the cross in Jerusalem. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, just one of the many verses that says something like this, says, Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. This is an important application right here. It's kind of one of our concluding applications because we're going to exegete the last part of this verse and then get to a couple more. But I want you to hear this by way of application. What is your sense of divine ought? Do you have that as a Christian? Do you have any sense as a Christian of divine oughtness in your life? It's almost impossible to be a Christian and not have that. Do you have that sense of, I must be about my father's business? And then that, that discernment to say, this is my father's business. Like, I'm not going to make up what my father's business is, so I use it as like a religious placebo, so I don't think I'm going to hell, and I'll trick myself until the day I die, and I find out that I never really was a Christian in the first place, because I tricked myself with religious placebos throughout my entire life, just doing the things that I thought were the father's will, but they really weren't the father's will. Do you have a legitimate sense of divine awe that I must be about my Savior's commandments? I must be about spreading the gospel. I don't care if people make fun of me. I must be about studying His Word. I must not forsake the assembling of the saints. I must come to the local worship service and stir up one another towards love and good works like Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25 tell me. I must carry other Christians' burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Galatians chapter 1, chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. I must do good to all men, but especially the household of faith. As a husband, I must love my wife as Christ loved the church. I must wash her with the watering of the word, even as Jesus washed his bride with the watering of the word. As a wife, I must submit to my husband. I must reverence and respect my husband. And even if they disobey the word, I'm trusting that they will be one without a word, to use language from 1 Peter chapter 3. I must do this. 
I must be loving. I must be bold. I must be in prayer. I must be given to communion with my God. I must not be lukewarm. I must not love the world or the things in this world. I must not have pride in possessions. I must avoid every hint of sexual immorality. I must do these things. Do you have that sense of divine oughtness? Or is Christian religion a mere spectator sport? Christians share with Jesus a sense of divine oughtness. And their motivations for that oughtness is like Jesus' motivations. They say, I love the Father. And so the world may know that I love the Father. I'm going to walk and run in the path of God's commandments. I love him. He sent his son to die on a cross for me. I am in love with him. He is my father. He is my God. He loved me before the foundation of the world. I was predestined by him in Christ Jesus. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4. Like he loved me before time began. And then he sent his son in time. And I was crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live. And then I'm raised with Christ and I'm seated in heavenly places with him. And when Christ appears, I will appear with him also in glory. And then I so will ever be with the Lord. Oh, I love the Father. That's why I do what I do. That's why I study the word of God. That's why I come in fellowship with believers. That's why I share the gospel. That's why I avoid those traps and those snares that would seek to hinder my running towards Christ. That's why. Love seek. Not to be my own religious pet project, but for the sake of the love of the Father who sent his Son for me and the sake of the love of the Son who offered up himself for me. That's the Christian's motivation. And then it's not just that. It's not just saying, well, I love God. I love God. No, no. Loving God and loving his people are inextricably joined together. You don't get one without the other. You don't get Christ without his church. And if you think you have Christ and you don't have his church, the odds are either you're in a backslidden state which you need to repent of or you don't have Christ and you don't have his church because you don't get one without the other. Over and over in 1 John, we're told that. And you do it because you actually love the brethren. God has shed abroad in the love of God in his heart, via, in your heart, via the Holy Spirit. I want to urge you, brethren, going off of the tone of what Jesus talked about last week, feel and embrace that sense of divine oughtness, namely for love's sake. Let your embracing be a response to gospel grace. <coughs> Let your embracing be a response to the ultimate demonstration of love and the family that God has joined you to. Jesus made it clear that he wasn't leaving because he was afraid of Herod killing him. Look at the second half of verse 33. For it cannot be that a prophet should perish outside of Jerusalem. Again, too, this appears to be an idiomatic expression. Because you got somebody like John the Baptist who didn't die in Jerusalem. So Jesus wasn't saying every prophet who is a prophet has to die in Jerusalem, otherwise they're really not a prophet. It's an idiomatic expression as though to say Jerusalem has become so associated with the blood of martyrs. That high and holy city has sunk so low. And we're going to talk more about that, Lord willing, next week as we unpack the significance of Jerusalem both in Jesus' day and in the days to come. But even as Spurgeon noted, probably this was a proverb amongst the Jews, which our Savior used and endorsed. For many years, Jerusalem had been stained with the blood of the prophets. So Jesus is saying, I've got to go. I've got a collision course with Jerusalem because a prophet cannot perish outside of Jerusalem. And he was going to go, and he was going to die on a hill called the Skull just outside of the city. And we'll unpack more of that a little bit more, Lord willing, next week. Two things I want to share with you by way of closing application. First one is this. One is for us to kind of embrace, and the second one is for us to behold before we close. And the first one is this. Let's be reminded that as we survey this text, we don't only have Jesus' example, but we have Jesus' spirit. (laughs) The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in us. So it'd be bad news for us if all we had was Jesus' example. Like, oh, Jesus gave us an example of how to live. You'd be in big trouble. I'd be in big trouble because we'd have no power in ourselves to do the things that we see Jesus do apart from having the spirit inside of us to produce the fruit that we wouldn't produce in ourselves. So when you see Jesus fearless in the face of a death threat, 
You don't say, well, I'm going to do that because Jesus did it. You say, no, by the grace of God, I can do that because the same Spirit that raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in me. I remember hearing a couple of years ago about John Calvin's ministry in Geneva. And there would be times when he would be walking through the neighborhood. He was there for two bouts of ministry. One was a shorter time and one was for an extended time. And people did not like him when he was there. Ultimately, they did when he was there for a longer period of time. But people would sometimes sick their dogs on him. Like he would be walking through Geneva and there would be people who would have their dogs and they would sick them on John Calvin. Or he would come up into the pulpit and he would begin to preach and just as he was about to preach, he would find a death threat on the pulpit. Thankfully, that's never been my experience. But what do you do when that happens? I don't know what you do. I think you'd probably call one of the elders and say, hey, just be on alert for this. Got this. And then I think what you would do is you stay the course. You know, so you're wise, like Elder Glenn. (laughs) Be on the lookout. Let's go. We've got to do what God has called us to do. Well, how do you do that? You do that because the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, and you know ultimately your days are in the Lord's hands. So a bit of practical advice. If you face fear, maybe it's not necessarily the fear that is associated with a death threat, but maybe you face the fear of man. Maybe you face the fear of tomorrow. Maybe you face some sort of fears in your life. I just want to remind you this morning, apply the word of God directly to you. Let God speak to you directly from His Word. Hear the words that God spoke to Joshua and apply them to yourself. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Hear the words of Isaiah spoken to you. Fear not, nor be dismayed, for I am with you. And I will strengthen you. My right hand will uphold you. Hear the word of the writer of Hebrews write to you. Say, we may confidently say, because Jesus has said, never will I leave you or forsake you, Hebrews 13, 5. Therefore, we may confidently or boldly say, the Lord is my helper. What can man do to me? Preach not only the gospel to yourself, but the truth that is inseparable to the gospel. Preach it to yourself and then embrace it and believe it because it's true, genuine Christian faith that will extinguish those fears. And sometimes it's not just enough to hear it said. But you have to say it again and embrace it in faith. Hear the word of God speaking right to you and say, it's hard, but I believe. I'm making it hard. It's not hard. It's just true, but I believe. And the last thing I just want to say is that Jesus fulfilled his calling, suffering the ultimate death upon the cross. And he fulfilled his calling on the way to the cross, even in the face of death. When I was preparing this message, the verse from the song, it often comes to mind, but it came to my mind yet again that we sing, Up to the hill of Calvary, my Savior went courageously, and there He bled and died for me. Hallelujah for the cross. Nothing deterred Jesus from getting to Jerusalem, and thank God nothing did, because He loved the Father, and He loved you. (laughs) So now, even though we stumble along the way to our heavenly Jerusalem, our forgiveness is not won by our perfect performance, but our forgiveness has been already merited by Jesus' perfect performance. So you have some divine oughts that I've encouraged you to embrace. You have some applications from this text that I've encouraged you to embrace. But the foundation of every bit of embracing that you do is the gospel, is the fact that Jesus was undaunted going to the cross for you. So when you feel insignificant, you think as a Christian, no, 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 he gave his life for me. I know I have no intrinsic value, so to speak, but to think of the Son of God loving me and giving himself for me, oh, I thank God I'm not alone. The Lord is my helper. What can man do to me? That's how you blend this whole text together by way of worship and application. And let's pray that the Lord would do that in our hearts. We're not done. Jesus isn't done here. Uh, But Lord willing, we'll consider the end of what he said in that moment next week. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name and we thank you. And we say hallelujah for the cross and the courage that your son exhibited all the way to the cross. Thank you that he was undaunted. Lord, I could imagine just the feelings that he faced 
even in his natural humanity, just to hear about people plotting and wanting to kill him. I can imagine that being one of the many ways in which he was just acquainted with grief, the grief of bloodthirsty men relentless, relentlessly hunting him and demonstrating evil. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would grant us, first and foremost, to just behold our Savior in worship and say, wow, he did that for the love of his Father and he did that for the love of me? Who am I? What am I that you would even be mindful of me, yet bear my cross? So, Father, may fresh worship arise out of our hearts as we see our Savior's purposeful conviction and we see his courageous courage that he demonstrated on the way to Calvary. Help us to worship him and think about him. But then secondarily, Father, I pray that you would protect us, even as we said last week in our text, protect us from that transgression, that sin of lukewarmness, and help us, Father, to embrace the divine oughts that you've given us. Help us to walk in the path of your commandments. Even as your son said, go baptize men in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. Help us, Father, in our respective stations of life and with our collective calling as Christians to embrace the divine oughts that you've given us. And help us, Father, when we aren't as resolute as we know we ought to be, by your grace, firm us up. Protect us from ungodly fears that would distract us on this journey. Help us to preach the truths that are inseparable to the gospel to ourselves and replace fear over and over again with confidence, assurance, and faith. So Lord, may you do those things. May you bring forth those graces in us afresh today. And we pray all these things, Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.